What the word Simshan means, people in the river. No, we're people up to Simshan. We're people of, <clears throat> of multiple resources, and we're people that were all one. And uh, we got different tribes, different WAPs, but we're still one. Kits and Kalem are part of the Simshan Nation and our traditional territory is of roughly about 12,756 square kilometers. This is an area that covers territory from Terrace down to Prince Rupert and across Chatham Sound down Grenville Channel, a large area of the Pacific Northwest. Now climate change is not a concept that we're dealing with for the first time. We've been dealing with it since time immemorial. The difference was that all of the observations and the stories, the traditional knowledge that was passed down from generation to generation was gathered through very careful and accurate observations of these changes. And that allowed us to start modifying and changing the ways in which we did things. And it allowed us to adapt. The problem now is that these changes are happening so fast that we can't, we can't keep up. Our Caribou have been replaced by moose. The mountain goats are no longer there. They're dwindling in, in, in number and the salmon runs are starting to fail. Our fish are coming back and they're smaller. So four-year-old fish look more like three-year-olds. And this is not just in salmon, but it's also happening in herring. Our harvest for kelp are not happening either. The seaweed is failing or it's happening earlier. The clams and the cockles are dwindling on the beaches. We don't exactly know why. It could be due to ocean acidification. These changes are happening very, very quickly. Climate change is real and climate change is happening. And it's interfering with food security. And for this reason, I have decided to turn the entire workload of the Fish and Wildlife Operations Department for Kitsum-Kalem into studying the effects of climate change and the threats that that poses into food security. So everything that we do is tied to climate change and tied to food security. Climate change is, is for us, it's so, it's heartbreaking. It's, it, it's, it, it has the potential of robbing our future generations and our generations who are here today of knowing our people's way of life and where our language comes from and our spiritual beliefs. I'm the seven, eight, and nine classroom teacher here at Naxagilikia. I've been so excited to be working on this amazing climate change documentary with the Kitsum Kalem Fisheries Department. I'm so proud of all of the science and combination of traditional knowledge that's been shared on this project. Our students have been working hard on their own personal climate change projects. They've had a chance to talk to their elders, to their family members, to community members about things and questions that they have about climate change on this local territory. Um, the other amazing part of this project is through this is that our students are able to use Western science and, and use that in their projects with that traditional knowledge. How important is it passed on traditional knowledge? If traditional knowledge wasn't passed on, we're gone, we're ended. You know, even our valley, it wasn't just up Miziad and way or way up there. There was glaciers in our back valleys here too, and they would keep the, the streams and the valleys cooler. And that'd keep the lake cooler, keep the river cooler, and all these little glaciers keep it cooler. But all those glaciers are, the glaciers that I see in here around, you know, they're not there no more. And uh, so I think those glaciers disappearing is, it's the next disaster that's going to come. I think when they're all gone, unless we start getting some more weather change, so it starts piling back up again, our streams are going to end up like the Fraser. 
where our guys used to go up the mountain to hunt mountain goat and they just lived on top of the mountain until the snow pushes them out and that they used to consume more goats living on the mountain than what they bring back after the hunting season. In the fall when you get the first uh, snowfall on a mountain top the goats will come down and that the goats will start moving right down close to the bottom and then uh, as that first snowfall melts the goats move up then when you have the second snowfall that the goats don't come down they're already in the timber so they don't see where they are so that over the years uh, at least what i've seen in my lifetime when i was a kid we used to see this river jam solid with ice even to the point where areas where we did our food fishing on a skina i i haven't done it but <clears throat> my brother and one of my uncles they crossed across the Skeena River on the ice just to explore to see what it's like that the ice was thick enough that they they can do that. Nowadays when you go through here through the winter there's very little ice on the Skeena River that it's uh, almost no ice in, in a few of the years that we've gone through. Traditional knowledge has helped my research in terms of being able to, to look at a glacier change further back in time. Um, so Western science is limited in its view and understanding in terms of time. We ha don't have a very long record of how the glaciers have changed. Um, traditional knowledge can help us push that further back in time, certainly. Additionally, Western science has a, a certain worldview and traditional cultures have a, a different unique worldview, a, a way of looking at the, the landscape that is no less valuable certainly, but a very different and unique component or, or way of looking at the, the world around us that is incredibly valuable and how to value the landscape and the resources around us. We know that water runs downhill and fish swim upstream. So we need to start at the beginning, and so we need to get a really good understanding of how the glaciers are behaving. So glaciers are this perfect natural frozen reservoir in the mountains, and they're perfect in that they only release fluxes of fresh cold water when we need it. So in times when it's rainy, or it's cold, we still have seasonal snow in the mountains or we have rain coming down that feeds uh, our, our streams and rivers. When it's hot and dry, typically uh, July, August, September, when we don't have the seasonal snow and we don't have as much rain, we have the glaciers. We have those frozen reservoirs to contribute and keep flow volumes high and stream temperatures low. Um, that timing is also critical in that it, it coincides when fish are returning, salmon are returning to their natal streams for spawning. Um, so that's this really beautiful, perfect natural reservoir system that glaciers offer us. Glaciers in terms of not only contributing flows and cold water, but also nutrients and being very important in the larger scheme of how nutrients are cycled in the freshwater environment and, and indeed out to um, the marine environment as well. And then the big problem, of course, moving forward is that if we have longer and more intense dry warm periods, we tap into that reservoir, we draw it down more. And so that reservoir then is smaller and less able to contribute those cold fresh flows when we need them in future years if, if temperatures are to warm even further. Forecasts for Western Canada are that by mid-century, most of the ice will be gone. So the larger reservoirs of ice, so the big ice fields to the south of us and the big ice fields to the north, they're going to last longer just because they're such huge ice masses. Here in the central coast, we have much smaller glaciers and they're generally at lower elevations. We're going to lose those more rapidly. So certainly by mid-century, much of our ice will be gone. Unfortunately, when we lose that natural ice reservoir, we lose that infusion of cold, um, high flows 
in the time we need it most, so that dry, warm period of late summer and early fall. Um, that can put stress on migrating salmon, juvenile salmon, um, in, in the freshwater environment. What happens when our glacier water flow decreases? One of the questions I have is for the glaciers. And that question is, um, how can we stop them from melting? Like, it's complicated, pretty simple, like pulling something out of the cord, out of the socket. Can we stop the glaciers from melting in Duck de Houn? I am a GIS specialist. I also specialize in photo imagery and background imagery for map. I use the EB drone to monitor glacial change and water change, water course change through the river systems. With the glacial change, we can monitor each year the different snow melt in the areas. By flying the EB drone, we can monitor the glacial change. So at every year, the glacial glaciers melt every year, and we can monitor the how fast they're melting. Another project we've just been starting with the uh, Kitsum Kalem community and involving uh, students and other faculty here at the college is with glacier monitoring and uh, studying the changes of the glaciers in the Kitsum Kalem watershed. So primarily thus far we've been using satellite imagery um, to look at how glaciers have changed since 1985 to present of all the glaciers in the traditional territory. And then now we're going to be starting some field work to look at how the glaciers are changing seasonally and how that relates to climate change. Seems like the timing of the world is off just a bit. Our family fished here forever. A lot of, a lot of little things are changing like the sockeye or something's happening with the sockeye and like we like each fish there does something <clears throat> and people just think fish is fish it isn't there's a different thing that we do with each species it's not there on the, we don't can it we could can it but it you have to eat it early kind of greasy or whatever but it starts fermenting in the jar and i never saw ever saw a mother can chinook i saw her can sockeye and uh pink and coho we always smoked it and dried it or ate it fresh um, so and steelhead, you know, that's our winter fish. Like, uh, like years ago, my auntie Winnie, we talked about <clears throat> when we did start living up here in Robin Town, it's the village up the canyon here. And, but they said the steelhead seemed to go in certain pools and the First Nations knew our guys knew all where it was and they would hook them out of there, similar to what you see at Morristown. Traditional knowledge has helped my research by knowing how the rivers used to be, I can help prove the difference of how they are now and how they're going to be in the future. It gives us a background information upon the rivers and how they used to be like with the salmon and wildlife around the river systems. It is important for the next generation to view the resources that we have currently and continue on our knowledge of the area and continue the traditional knowledge that has been handed down to us from the elders. That way we can continue to harvest our resources and make good uses and wise choices with our resources. Uh, traditional knowledge has helped us in our project here in that because of the fact that we'll never be able to know exactly how this area was back in the olden days. All we can, but we can rely upon the, the memory of the elders that belong in our village and stuff. And I know that we can never, you know, fix this area and make it back to the way, pristine the way it was before. But now that we have the, the elders and have been able to kind of give us an idea and paint a picture for us, we have like a goal that we can kind of shoot for. Our salmon are returning in fewer numbers. And those that are returning are exhibiting higher numbers of parasites, both internally in their organs and externally on their skins and on the gills. Why is this happening? We don't know, but it's important to understand and find out why this is happening, because this is definitely a threat to the food security of the Kitsum Kalem. Climate change definitely has an impact on this, but the impacts are difficult to figure out. Climate change has changed 
the variability in the yearly flooding patterns of the Kitsum-Kalum River. And this doesn't only threaten fish habitat, but it also threatens the community. The floods that used to occur once every hundred years are happening now every five years, and we don't know what's going to continue to happen. So we need to study the hydrology of the region. We need to understand how these changes are going to affect our rivers so that we can mitigate them, so that we can prepare for them, and so that we can do whatever it is we need to do to ensure that not only food security, but the people in the community are safe. Is climate change affecting the way our fish come back to us? In Dehti Hound. Dehti Hound, what do you think? The first project we've been working with with Kitsum Kalem and involving students here at the college is monitoring of stream temperatures. So are the stream temperatures of the Kitsum Kalem watershed at critical levels? Are they, are they very warm? Are they at good levels for salmon? Are they too cold? Um, and what we found is that the stream temperatures now are, are in a really good place um, for salmon productivity. Uh, and this project's been really fun in that we've been able to involve Kitsum Kalem community members, but also uh, community college students and a really fun interactive research in the traditional territory here close to the terrace and close to the Northwest Community College campus. This fishway is the, pretty much what the main corridor for fish moving in and out of the back channel. Keeping this clear and, uh, and passable is one of our main jobs out here and we usually do it at least once every two days just in case because of, you know, there's only two ways into the back channel. So, so yeah, this is our fishway. So as soon as we have an idea of what may be causing these changes, then we'll be able to start formulating or coming up with adaptation strategies that will ensure or increase or improve the health of the salmon, the health of the habitat, so that we can give them a better chance to survive and to reproduce. Wah, which is Olikins, and Wah, or Halamot, um, is our name for Olikin. Halamot literally means save your fish. It's our first fresh fish of the new year. For our people, prior to the introduction of all of these um, commercial foods, for our people, um, the, uh, wah, the Olikin was called Halamot because up until that time, our method of survival was through all of the food that we had preserved throughout the summer to get us through the winter and to also the food that we would trap for. So there was no fishing for a very long period of time and the, um, in terms of what we were able to trap couldn't feed our entire communities, our villages, the way that fishing does. So when for, for us, that fish and it's, it's coming, the, uh, the halamot was a signal for us that it was the sign of our new year. This is when our new year celebrations happen and um, it's that abundance of that run that typically dictates the seasons to come of life. Um, all of what we do is, is based on our seasonal rounds and our spiritual beliefs also as, as well um, in our connection to our wah, our oligans, our hon and all the different species of our salmon. And um, with our olikins, we, um, the seasons, the time of, time of year, it's always around this, this year, that's why we call this time of year Hatli Lach Sechwah, it's the time of the olikins. But um, that time period is, is changing. It's, it's getting a little bit later, and the runs are much, much smaller than they've been um, historically. Every year they get smaller and smaller. Olican time is always a good year for everybody. First feed is always the best. After so many, you know, winter months, there's hardly any fresh stuff. And Olican time, everybody's happy. And it's so nice to see all these kids here today to learn about Olican. We learned when we were young how to prepare for the winter time. 
And Ulican time is our elders years ago used to be happy when Ulican time comes. Fresh feed of food, uh, fish before the salmon starts. Feed. After we get hobans, we either smoke it, salt it, sun dried. And now we could freeze them years ago. We never had no deep freeze or anything. And then, so we just have to smoke it sun dried or salt it. Because we didn't have no fridge years ago. And Oxdal, where we usually get ours is, we go out with my brother and sisters and my mom. She used to make a big dip net. And we loaded the skiff down and I don't know how many times she filled the smoke out of. And then we go back to Essenton on the weekend and hand them around to people that live there. Especially the elders that can't go out and get any. People are getting kind of concerned about our food sources and one of our food sources is Ooligan. You know, it's something, you know, that the tribes in this area have depended on for years. Like usually, traditionally, like back in, before technology and, and that stuff, uh, like everyone was pretty much, by this time of the year, people were getting kind of thin, you know, getting kind of hungry, getting kind of, you know, hurting for food. And the Ooligan was, was, you know, you know, come up the river and it was just a bonanza of food and protein for, you know, all the creatures around here and for the locals. Now, even though these fish were plentiful along the coast of BC, their numbers have dwindled and only the Skeena and the Nass have viable populations that have not yet been classed as endangered. So the problem with the Skeena is that we didn't really know how many Ulican were returning into the system. And so what we decided to do is to protect the stock and to come up with a better management strategy. We started trying to calculate what the size of the stock was. Why are the Ulican numbers so low in our territory? In the Dihan. It hasn't really been, we haven't done a lot of Ooligan research on the Skeena. It has been done much, but not something as like, um, as comprehensive as ours. Um, ours, as, as I told you, is over a three year span so far, which we plan on continuing to as well. But, uh, but yeah, we're getting some surprising information out of it. In recent years, we found glass sponge reefs at the bottom of Chatham Sound. Is it possible that these incredibly ancient ha uh, ecosystems which are now endangered through the development of pipelines and LNG plants, uh, is it possible that these are the nurseries where not only the halibut juveniles go, but also the ulican larvae go? We know from ROV footage that there are large populations of shrimp, we know there's a lot of kopi pods swimming around because in the video you can see them milling around around the lights. And we see large numbers of juvenile rockfish and other fish in there. So these are incredibly important ecosystems. Now when we look at climate change, it has been decided, and we have a pretty good idea, that the ecosystems that are gonna suffer first are those that are close to the surface. And the ecosystems that are gonna be the foundation and the fulcrum of maintaining these populations of fish available as food for not just people but other other components of the ecosystem are the ones that are on the on the bottom the benthic ecosystems are not going to react quite as quickly because they're protected from that warm surface water so the entire concern with with Climate change is not whether it rains today or it snows tomorrow. 
These are not localized. These are global in nature. So we have to look at a landscape in order to try and determine what the impacts of these changes are happening. For the Kitsimkalem, we do not have the ability to go global. We can look at satellite images that are produced by NASA. We can talk to scientists from fisheries and oceans or NOAA to kind of get an idea of what's going out in the ocean, but we know very little of it. We are working within the confines of what we know and the areas that we have influence on, our traditional territories. I stole the sun to bring back the light. I need your light within to bring back the fish. Go ask your elders. Go ask yourselves. Sam Welch. Find your song and bring back the fish. <laughs> 